Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's session. We're really excited to have you with us today. We're going to be talking with Eric Black um, about launching a mobile network for a fleet of cruise ships, um, basically with entertainment cruises. Eric, you on the call? Yes, hi. Hi. All right, let me make this bigger here for our presentation. Um, so we have an action-packed agenda. We're going to try to work through this as quickly as possible so we can get to the meat of the session today, which is our case study and talking to Eric. Um, so we'll go through a very brief introduction to Cisco Meraki, why you might want to consider cloud networking, and then we're going to launch into the meat, which is uh, talking to Eric about his Entertainment Cruises Meraki deployment. Um, it's going to be sort of a fireside chat. We do have a lot of slides. I'm going to try to move through those quickly and intersperse those uh, by switching around and uh, demoing Eric's network. He's graciously allowed us to do a live demo of the Entertainment Cruises Network. So that will be awesome. And then, um, time permitting, we will wrap up with a brief overview of all of our product families and get to some Q&A. So that reminds me, uh, we do have someone on the call with me today, my good friend and colleague, Kat. She's here to help answer any and all questions that you might have. So if you do have questions, please enter those into your GoToWebinar control panel in the Q&A section. I should be collecting those. Uh, we'll be um, posing questions to Eric uh, and to myself during the session. So we're really relying on you guys to answer questions to guide the conversation today. Uh, and my name is Emily. I'm a product marketing manager here at Cisco. Now, before we get started, a bit of house cleaning. I am excited to announce that we have free access points for the qualified IT professionals on the call today. It's an 11N access point. We'll throw in a three-year cloud management license with it as well. So 100% free, yours to keep and use however you'd like. All the features that we demo today on the wireless side in Eric's network will be available to you. So it's a great way to get your hands on Meraki gear and Meraki technology, test drive our dashboard. Uh, and if you have any questions, I would definitely check out the URL down there at the bottom of your screen for any eligibility details. That's meraki.cisco.com slash free AP. And what we'd like for you to do is to call us and confirm your shipping information after this session so that we can ship you your free access point and get it to the right address. So there should be a reminder email in your inbox. Um, you can check your spam folders. It often ends up there, unfortunately. But in that reminder email about this, uh, this webinar will be the contact information for your Cisco Meraki rep. That's who you want to call to confirm your shipping information with. So without further ado, uh, for those of you for whom this is a, a totally new introduction, uh, Meraki, the company, was actually founded in 2006 by a research team from MIT, and they were working on a project called the RoofNet Project. It was called that because they were literally climbing on top of uh, Cambridge apartment building rooftops, affixing wireless access points to them, and then trying to figure out how to manage those over the internet. Um, so you can see we've been in the cloud since day one, and that technology, of course, was the foundation for Meraki, and, and uh, the company did expand out beyond making wireless access points uh, to include, in total, four product lines. So we've got the wireless access points. We also make uh, a line of switches. We make a line of security appliances, and we have 100% free mobile device management. And all of this equipment is designed to be managed over the internet, so cloud-managed networking. Uh, Cisco took note and bought us at the end of 2012, so we're excited to say we're the new cloud networking group within Cisco. Uh, we're still committed to all four of our product lines, and we've been recognized for innovation uh, by folks at Gartner and InfoWorld and a few other of the uh, leading IT uh, analysts and media. So um, we often get the question when we're introducing Cisco Meraki, you know, well, why are customers choosing cloud networking in the first place? Uh, and uh, one of the reasons, and there's several, but one of the reasons is you have uh, complete 
end-to-end -end visibility and control over your network. Let's assume you have a full stack of Meraki equipment from the, from the edge with your security appliance all the way down to the mobile device, and you have this visibility and control from anywhere in the world you have internet, from any internet accessible device. Uh, the cloud provides benefits not just of visibility and control, but also scalability. So you can pre-configure any piece of Meraki equipment before it's ever been plugged into power, before it's ever been plugged into uh, the internet. Once it is plugged in, it'll grab its configuration settings from the cloud and run with that. So it makes remote deployment of sites very, very easy. And I, I think Eric will be um, talking about this a little bit later, and we'll be highlighting that when how he deployed uh, devices and, and Meraki equipment on, on his ships. Uh, and then you have things like cost benefits and cost savings. So because we're cloud managed, you don't have a lot of the same mm, bottlenecks that you would find with traditional architecture. So you don't have to buy uh, you know, controllers or redundant controllers. You don't have device limits like AP limits or anything like that. We've pushed all of that out to the cloud. So not only can we grow and shrink rapidly um, in terms of devices and, and networks, uh, but you also will find that you're not going to be paying for the redundant on-site hardware um, that's necessary when you have to buy controllers. You might find that you're spending less money and time training your IT staff because we have a very, very intuitive graphical interface. There's no command line. And you might also find that you are spending less money and time traveling to remote sites because you have this great visibility and control, again, from anywhere in the world that you have internet. So the way it works is Meraki equipment sits on site at your respective location. So that might be a wireless access point, it might be a switch, it might be a security appliance. And that gear will initiate a secure connection back to our cloud. And by cloud, I mean our data center is hosted all over the world. And it's, it is a secure connection. It's encrypted twice once with proprietary encryption, and then again uh, with SSL. And it's a small connection. It's, it's only about one kilobit per second per device. And that's because we are not storing or seeing any end user data. We're simply collecting management and monitoring statistics that we need to uh, provide the information that you'll see in the demo. So things like what type and number of client devices are connecting, what applications are they using, what's their bandwidth consumption, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we also feel that the cloud-based uh, approach, or the cloud-managed approach, I should say, aligns very clearly with industry trends. So we're seeing a lot of organizations reducing IT count or asking their IT staff to do more with less the smaller, leaner IT organizations. And so you need a solution that's intuitive, that's easy to install, easy to get up and running, uh, and makes it easy for a lean IT staff to deploy to multiple remote sites. Um, we're seeing a lot of folks wanting to provide guest access. Um, so anything from guest Wi-Fi to perhaps uh, segregated guest VLANs, things like that. Uh, maybe they need PCI compliance. Maybe they want mobile device management. So we provide all of that functionality with our solution. And then we're seeing a lot of folks needing, um, needing to control bandwidth. They want to prioritize certain applications while restricting others. And they need to be able to do that from the network devices because uh, oftentimes we're seeing sort of BYOD environments. They don't, uh, you know, IT staff doesn't necessarily have control over every device that's connecting to their network. So we'll go through, keep these trends in mind when we go through and show you the uh, features of Eric's network um, because you can see how we address each and every one of them. Uh, and then finally, when we're talking about the cloud, one awesome benefit of Cisco Meraki equipment uh, is the fact that we do provide seamless updates pushed from the cloud. There's no need for you to manually install and update individual pieces of equipment. Uh, we can handle it for you. You just set a date and a time when you would like updates to occur after we've notified you that they're there. And by updates, I don't just mean uh, firmware sort of bug updates. You'll actually get feature enhancements and feature improvements. 
Um, so the way our licensing model works, we try to keep things as simple as possible. You buy your hardware, you buy a license to operate your hardware. That license, for whatever duration it may be, one year all the way through, I think, 10 years, that license will include all of your technical support, all access to the cloud management and, and the dashboard and the interface there and the tools to manage your, uh, your piece of equipment, as well as access to all the feature updates that we're going to push out. And so this is a, this is a very, very short modified version of um, some of the feature updates that we've been seeing across all four product lines. Uh, so people wake up one day and if they have wireless access points, um, you know, they realize, wow, I have location analytics. Or, you know, if you are uh, an MX uh, security appliance customer, you woke up, uh, you might wake up and find out that I, I have geo-based IP firewall rules. So it's, it's pretty neat. Um, the device you own three years from now will have more features than the device you buy today uh, because we will have updated it so much. Okay, that was our that was our whirlwind introduction to Cisco Meraki. So let's actually pivot um, and and start our session on entertainment cruises, which is the meat of the presentation. Um, before we begin, I just want to highlight a few things again for anyone who joined late. One, please, please, please feel free to ask questions in the Q and A box in your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, we'll be using those to to guide the session. Uh, we have a, a lot of slides. I'm going to try to move through them fairly quickly. If something sort of passes before your eyes, have no fear. We're recording this session, and we will make it available on our website later. So um, some of the slides are sort of background and backdrop, uh, but we're not necessarily going to be going bullet point by bullet point. And I will be trying something new and interspersing the slides with, uh, with demo as we go. Okay, without further ado, Eric, if you're, if you're on the call, do you mind just saying hello and giving us a brief introduction of yourself and your role at Entertainment Cruises? Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Eric Black. I'm the Applications Manager here at Entertainment Cruises. Um, you may not have heard of Entertainment Cruises, but you might have heard of one of our brands, uh, Odyssey Cruises, Sea Dog mm -hmm. Cruises, Spirit Cruises. Um, we have offices on the East Coast and here in Chicago, where I'm located. Uh, I've been here since uh, 2009, and I got to work on a project to figure out how to get reliable Wi-Fi and Internet connectivity on our ships, and we ended up picking Meraki, and here we are. Great. Um, and then just a little bit, I think you were just giving a, uh, a, giving a, uh, an introduction to Entertainment Cruises. Um, so you guys, you're headquartered in Chicago. You've got a bunch of different fleets, or, or ships, I should say, in your fleet. Um, can you let us know sort of what, what you've got and, and where you're deployed? Yep, so we're mostly on the East Coast, uh, New York, Boston, Baltimore, uh, D.C., uh, here in Chicago. We've opened a new operation down in Florida. Um, we have dining cruise vessels, so it might be a 500-passenger vessel that will go out in a harbor or on a lake for a few hours. And we also have some smaller vessels, which could be chartered for smaller parties, uh, you know, 200 people. Approximately, and then we have a brand called Sea Dog. That's a it's a speedboat that holds about 150 passengers. Okay, so, so lots lots of people in small places sometimes. Exactly. Like. Okay, great. Um, so one of the things I always like to to launch the conversation with is just a question of you know why were you looking to update your network? What challenges were you facing? There may be some other folks on the call who managing cruise ships or managing sort of mobile outdoor sites that they want to network in some way. Um, can you speak a little bit about the challenges and what you were looking for when you started investigating vendor options? Sure. Well, we've had some challenges. I'm sure as you can imagine, uh, creating a reliable internet connection from a cruise ship um, because the cruise ship is moving. And so we've been trying 3G, 4G cards, um, some satellite-based internet technologies, uh, wireless technologies that are available in certain markets. Mm -hmm. And we've come up with a combination of wireless uh, Ethernet technologies and 3G, 4G that um, Cisco Meraki MX devices can accommodate really well with the auto failover so that if our ship is in an area where we might not have one type of signal or the other, it will automatically fail over and then fail back once it's regained um, once it's regained the signal. And also, being a distributed network, we've, we've had challenges 
pushing out configurations to all devices across our fleet. Um, mm -hmm. That might be because some ships might not have internet 24 hours a day, so we might have to remember to go back and update a config on a switch. You know, the next day that might not happen, um, but with the dashboard, you can go in and apply a change to all switches, and then once they get connected back to the uh, Meraki Cloud Controller, they'll go ahead and update to that new configuration. So, you know, ease of manageability, as well as the um, the auto VPN and auto failover technologies, are what we what we found with you. Awesome, and I'll just say for folks on the call who may not be familiar. Um, the auto VPN is probably the killer feature of our, one of the killer features, I should say, of our MX security appliance. It's a way to set up site-to-site -site IPsec VPN in about three clicks, which is great. Um, and I, I briefly mentioned the benefits of, of cloud being that you can quickly deploy your gear. Um, do you want to speak a little bit about this? I was, I was really surprised to learn that on your large ship you only needed two people and not even a full day to, to get stuff up and running. Yeah, it was pretty easy. We configured everything ahead of time in the dashboard and brought down the devices to the vessel. And honestly, most of the time was spent taking out old equipment and doing some rewiring. Uh, but we got everything uh, racked and installed. And as soon as the internet connection came up, all of the devices downloaded their configs. And then there was just minor tweaking to, you know, settings here and there to get everything up and running how we wanted, but it, it came online in a day, and that, that was pretty impressive. That's great. And I, just for the folks on the call, too, when we're talking about the remote deployment features or support for quickly deploying uh, remote sites using Meraki equipment, not only can you pre-configure gear in your dashboard, again, from anywhere in the world you have internet, uh, and not only do we have seamless updates, but one of the things that we'll show you um, momentarily is the diagnostics and troubleshooting tools that are built right into the dashboard. You can troubleshoot and work on a device. We call them live tools. Um, again, you've got that end-to-end -end visibility and control and uh, the ability to get uh, reporting and notifications in the event of equipment outages and failures and, and things like that. Um, so I think right before we start uh, checking out your your network, Eric, um, and I can see Kat is going to write up some questions as well, probably from the audience. I was wondering if you can just give us an overview of what the configuration looks like on the ships themselves. Yeah, we kind of use your, uh, your full stack of products. We use the MX60 model um, as our firewall and then a 24-port switch, and we have the two to three access points for each ship. And okay. so the firewall is connected via 3G, 4G card, and in a couple of our markets, uh, connected to an Ethernet uplink, which is which uh, connects to a wireless Ethernet um, network mm -hmm. that we subscribe to in a few cities. And then back here at the, um, in our co-location facility, we have an MX100 acting as the VPN concentrator for the auto VPN technology. And we also use the systems manager to keep track of some company-owned um, iOS devices that we have for purpose-specific functions, such as scanning tickets. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's pretty much a typical boat. Awesome. So full stack. Um, what I'm going to do is actually just switch over to your network right now and, and go through some basic overview uh, pieces, and then we'll, we'll get back to the slides. We did have one question from the audience. Uh, and I know you, you touched on this, but how exactly are you getting internet? Perhaps, uh, especially if you're using something like satellite, um, I guess, how does that connect with the MX? Or how, how do you mostly get your internet? In a couple markets, there's a company called Business Only Broadband. Mm -hmm. And they provide, uh, they call it wireless ethernet. And they install a satellite and some device, I've never actually seen the device, but there is an ethernet handoff and it is just a connection to the internet. So where we can, we deploy that because as you know, um, 3G, 4G connections have intermittent performance and data caps and we have to you know, be mindful of all that. So where we can, we prefer to use the, the wireless ethernet technology, but where we can't, we use 3G, 4G for internet access. Great. And a follow-up question to that is, what sort of 
uplink speeds are you getting with your 3G, 4G? If you know. uh, typical 3G, 4G uh, behavior. So sometimes it's reasonably fast. Um, sometimes it's slower than we would like it to be. In mm -hmm. some markets, we do have the, uh, LTE, so that is you know very reasonable speed. But in others, uh, we it fails back to 3G a lot, and you know that's just a, a side effect of the provider that we're using. Great. All right. So without further ado, let's switch over really quickly and take a look. Uh, this I think is your network, hopefully. Um, and if you have any anything you want to pipe up and and say at any point, Eric, please feel free. But what I did was, for those of you that were paying attention, I, I opened up a browser. I went to dashboard.meraki.com. I logged in with my username and credentials. That's what any of you would do. And right away, I'm dumped into an overview page where I can get a sense for where in the world I have Meraki equipment deployed for my network. I can expand this view here and see all of my different networks, um, You know, sort them by usage perhaps, see the uptime over the last week, and you can see uh, green means the network uh, was healthy and had connectivity to the cloud. Red means at some point something was offline. So you can actually see the number of devices that are offline versus the numbers that are online. Um, you know, you could type in and search uh, for specific networks this way if you'd like. If you had hundreds of networks or just dive into any single one. And in terms of the visibility and control, uh, you know, where we just ended up is probably one of the favorite pages of our customers is our client page. This is where you would actually come in and for a given network see the bandwidth consumption for a given time frame, see the number of clients that have connected to a network over a given time frame, um, who they all are listed out, see whether they're wired or wireless connections. Uh, and there's a slew of information a slew of information, pardon me, that you can I click into a client that you can actually enable here. So you can, you know, come in and do things like say, all right, I'm very curious to see if we had, uh, you know, any iOS devices here, so we do have one. Uh, you know, you can search by MAC address, IP address, uh, the description of the device, which is the MAC address right now, uh, the manufacturer, you know, maybe you want to find Intel clients, things like that. Um, if you have different operating systems, uh, you know, you can definitely search, for example, um, maybe we have some Windows devices here. We can find them very, very quickly. So from a BYOD perspective, you can come in and say, okay, you know, do I have any legacy Windows XP clients? How are they connecting? Uh, once you have a client, it's very, very easy to click into it and drill down and get more information about a particular client. Um, you can see since Eric has Meraki switches, which switch on which port this device is connected into ultimately when it flows upstream. Um, you get information about what kind of applications the device has been consuming, whether or not it has any security policies, and if for some reason you had to apply a security policy to a device, you can very easily go in, block it, whitelist it, apply a group policy if any had been defined. Um, if we're talking about wireless networks, you can even apply policies based on SSID. Uh, and a bunch of other things, and, you know, check and make sure it's on the right VLAN, ping it. Uh, we have the ability to run a remote packet capture, so a slick tool that's provided for all of our um, all of our equipment is this ability to take packet captures, and you can actually stream a capture to CloudShark if you want, and then view your packet captures later. So a lot of great uh, information right up front and, and sort of troubleshooting there. Um, but from this, from this network uh, client page, aside from seeing all the clients and getting a sense uh, of what types of operating systems and devices are connecting, you also get uh, something that we call application fingerprinting. So we come in here and we can actually see which applications these clients are, are using and consuming. And one of the benefits to us of being cloud-based is that we've algorithmically classified and tagged hundreds of websites and applications. Um, so we're constantly updating this list in the background. You can see all the different things here that um, that Eric's network has sort of touched on, but there's a ton of different applications out there that we're constantly keeping up to date in terms of being able to identify them. And there's nothing you need to do on your end to have any of this visibility. Uh, 
you don't have to install anything on the client devices or anything like that. It's, it's just innate. It's built into Meraki equipment. And so right away, you know, you could very quickly come in and see, well, where where is my bandwidth going? You know, Windows file sharing. Maybe this is or isn't something that we want to see. Um, and right away, you can come in, get more information about a particular type of application, uh, and see who the top consumers are. There's also a setting that could be enabled but isn't uh, right here, but you could enable the ability to actually see the specific uh, destination. So if it, if it was a category like miscellaneous web, uh, you could actually go in and see, well, what are the websites that are being accessed and, and how much active time is being spent there per client. And then again, you know, it's very easy to drill down into any single client device uh, and, uh, and make uh, policy adjustments or, or things like that. Um, so that's a very, very quick overview of, of sort of the client visibility that you can get. Um, what I want to do is, is switch back. We're going to be switching back and forth between the, uh, the presentation and talk about a couple of different uh, functionalities or features, I should say, of Eric's network. Um, so we were talking about the 3G, 4G failover capability. Um, have you ever had this work? Have you ever had to use the failover? Yeah, we do. In some cruising patterns, the primary connection will drop, so it will fail over to 3G, 4G. And then it will mm -hmm. fail back once that connection reestablishes and the uh, switch or the MX detects that there is connectivity on that port again. Great. So it does, it does work. <laughs> awesome. Um, and we had a question which was, when does that failover actually kick in? Um, and the answer to that is, you know, if you're using uplinks, it's whenever your uplinks are not available. So we're using dual WAN uplinks, so all of our MX security appliances support the ability to have two separate WAN uplinks. Um, the 3D, 4D failover would occur if both WAN uplinks were to fail. Uh, and I will I'll actually show you when we go through uh, demoing the MX where you can where you can set that up. And I bet a bunch of folks are interested in the mobile device management. So you are using iOS uh, company owned devices. Do you install mobile device management on any other type of, of of device, Android, Chromebooks, anything like that, or is it mostly iOS? The only company-owned devices that we have are iOS devices, and those are the only types of devices that we have in Meraki Systems Manager. So we've only had experience with iOS with Systems Manager. Okay. And are you uh, requiring any BYOD devices? I guess it sounds like no, but not requiring BYOD devices to enroll in your, in your MDM? Uh, we're using a different solution for that. Okay. All right. Fantastic. So again, for those uh, who may not be familiar with the Meraki solution, we, we do offer free mobile device management. It's called Systems Manager for iOS, Android, Macs, and PCs. Uh, and it does give you the ability to do things like uh, group your devices into profiles, push out security and feature restrictions, deploy applications, run security audits, uh, do some sort of uh, sort of lightweight software inventory management and things like that. Um, so let me actually uh, switch back over to our demo. Um, as far as the security appliance, um, I did want to show you where you can go in. All of our equipment, whether it's a, an MX or an access point or a switch, will have a uh, appliance status page, if you will, which tells you the name of the, the piece of equipment, whether it's online. Um, some useful statistics about it. So we're looking at a security appliance here. Now, as far as the 3G, 4G goes, when you enable a card, um, you'll be able to see the status of the 3G, 4G cellular here. Um, so sometimes it's connecting. Sometimes it's, you know, once it has established a connection, it's active. And what you can actually do is go in and set specific firewall and traffic shaping policies uh, for the cellular connection as well as your regular uplinks. So if you want to ensure that if you fail over to cellular, uh, certain uh, you know, layer three rules are in play, you can do that. Uh, if you want to go in and make sure that when you fail over to cellular, uh, you, know, you have certain traffic shaping uh, abilities. So maybe you don't want to have an unlimited uplink speed for cellular. Maybe you want to throttle it because uh, it's a backup. You can do that as well. So a lot of different functionality there. Um, now, in terms of the, um, let's see, what were we talking about here? We were talking about the MDM. 
So one of the things that you can do is set up a systems manager network, and you guys can do this today if you want. You don't have to run Meraki hardware uh, underneath to, to get this to work. Um, you do have to log into the dashboard to manage your mobile devices. But again, if you have iOS, Android, Macs, or PCs, and you want to just test drive our dashboard, you can download Systems Manager for free. And you can see it ties right in with our paid uh, dashboard uh, views for our APs and our switches and our security appliances. And what you do is, you obviously, you enroll the devices into your network. Um, there's many, many, many different ways to do that. And then once you have them, you can group them into profiles, uh, basically, you know, um, you know, do I have sales iPads versus uh, executive iPads and things like that? And once the devices are enrolled, you can quickly see who's online. Um, you know, you can do things like search, similar to what we saw earlier, um, find iPads. There's a slew of information here that you can enable to view up front from your, from your dashboard view. And you can click into any single device uh, very quickly and get way more information, granular information about that device. Um, and then there's a bunch of tools here that become available because you have the mobile device management profile on the device. So selectively wiping or erasing the device, locking it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a lot more details about what kind of device it is and you know, whether it's up to date and how long it's been online. And what you can also do is then come in and uh, set security and feature restrictions. So, um, you can select, uh, again, remember you created groups with profiles. You can go in and select a particular profile uh, and go in and then enforce restrictions. So Eric is using iOS devices, so all of these restrictions are available. Um, and we let you know if something is dependent on the iOS version, but you can select or deselect any of these. Uh, tons and tons of information here. You can go in, set passcode complexity requirements, go in and, uh, and actually set up a wireless template. So we're actually going to be talking about this uh, in a minute, I think, in the slides. But um, you can go in and make sure that mobile devices can automatically connect to a wireless network without having to go in and type in passwords or um, set authentication requirements uh, to each, uh, each device. And so there was a question, which is, what is a profile from the audience? Uh, and the answer to that, a profile is just a group. It's just a way to group devices. Um, you know, you might want to say, uh, you know, teacher iPads versus student iPads, uh, or maybe you want to, uh, you know, delineate certain groups of devices based on department or things like that. You would use profiles to sort of uh, arrange that so that you can go and then set different security settings based on a profile. Um, you can also go in and push out uh, mobile applications. So very, very easy to do. Again, you just sort of uh, select what you want to. It's not Enterprise App, let's say iOS App. Uh, so we do integrate with um, uh, Google Marketplace, uh, the Apple Store, things like that. You can go in and search for uh, specific applications. If it's in the App Stores, we'll find it. You can go in and, uh, and add it. Um, I'm going to pretend like I'm adding a paid version here, just so you can see there's many ways of doing this. We've actually updated Systems Manager recently. Um, there's some great blog posts on uh, some of the updates with, say, for example, Apple's um, device enrollment program and things like that. But a very basic way to add an application is to pick the app, uh, type in a redemption code if it's a paid app, and then uh, remember um, you created profiles and, and, and tagged different devices. You can come in here and select uh, which devices get which, which app. It's a really, really high level, very quick overview of Systems Manager, but it's, it's a very powerful tool if you do have devices that you're managing um, that are company owned where you can actually put the profile on the device uh, and you want to push out apps, manage security and feature restrictions and, and things like that. So moving along, um, I do want to talk about Wi-Fi with you, Eric. Um, can you tell us a little bit about you know, what you're using your wireless for, um, any issues you've been having, or challenges that you faced when you were setting it up? Definitely. Um, as the slide says, Wi-Fi is kind of an expected amenity today at a lot of venues, and ours is 
certainly one of them. So before we installed um, permanent access points on some vessels, we were having the crew bring on mobile hotspots and set that up for a specific event if a customer required Wi-Fi um, for some reason and tear it down after. And that's not very good. So wanted to get a more permanent setup going, and we found that really easy with Meraki. Uh, that's actually where we started, is by getting a free AP, and we uh, played around with it and found out how powerful it really was. And so we built it out uh, so that we have SSIDs for the public, um, for groups that may need a, a wire, wireless internet with a certain level of service. Um, we have it for one of our third-party vendors on our ships, and then we have it for um, POS-type devices on our ships. So we've segmented a bunch of different SSIDs on the same uh, set of access points. And so now we can offer our guests you know, video streaming if they need that, or uh, if like a corporate group comes on board, they might want to provide their attendees access, and now they, we can provide that to them very easily. Great. So we're getting um, a slew of questions from the audience uh, I think some of them are, are probably ones that you can answer. One is, um, are, what is the average number of client devices per AP that you're seeing uh, deployed out on your ship? We've seen about 20 at a time, um, which isn't that heavy, to be honest. Um, and you know, their, their overall performance is definitely dependent on the whatever type of internet we're connected to, whether that is the wireless Ethernet or the 3G, 4G connection. Um, it definitely does slow down when there's 20 people on a, a 3G connection. So the performance within the network is definitely fine and definitely manageable. Um, mm -hmm. But it is that kind of the connection to the internet that does you know, dictate their overall uh, performance that they experience. Great. Um, there's a question that I can take, which is, uh, when viewing a dashboard, can access be given to specific devices on the network um, for specific administrators? Um, I think that's getting to sort of role-based access and, uh, and whether or not um, you can sort of vary your levels of administrative control. And so the answer is we do support role-based access control. Um, you, when you go in and you create a dashboard account, you're creating an organization-wide account initially, and so you'll have organizational admins, and within that you can have read-only, full access, um, varying levels there. And then within an organization, you can create individual networks, uh, and you can actually assign different administrators access and privileges to different networks, whether it's full or read-only. Um, there's special guest ambassador accounts if you only need someone to be able to issue uh, maybe, maybe temporary guest Wi-Fi codes. We have the ability to have port administrators, too, for our switches. So if you only want to grant someone port-based access, uh, you can do that as well. That's a great question. Uh, we, had a, we had a question uh, for you, Eric, which is um, what was, there was the Florida Windridge Cave network, uh, and it seemed to be red. Do you have any insight on, on what was going on with that? Not right now. I'll have to ask our, our networking team why that is. I, those are, uh, that's a new vessel for us that honestly um, might not be set up fully yet. Okay. That's one of our um, new We had another question, I think, referring to the ability, uh, I guess, if you go in and you're actually looking at your access points, which is probably good to do since we just talked about them. Um, so we're looking at the Chicago Odyssey uh, network, and we can see you've got three access points, uh, one of which is online right now. Uh, the question, I think, referred to uh, this piece here, which is, uh, I guess if we did a satellite view, um, you know, does the AP move dynamically on the map as the ship moves? I don't believe so, uh, because to place an AP on the map, you actually uh, type in uh, an address. Um, you come in here and uh, usually either type in an address or uh, it gets automatically deployed if you've set an address uh, somewhere higher upstream, I guess. But um, I don't know if you, if you have any comments on that, Eric. But you can go in and place, place the APs on a map or if you upload a floor plan view. Um, if you had something like an office view here, you could go in and upload floor plan maps and place the APs on a floor plan view. 
And what we're looking at actually is the uh, the appliance status page for an access point. So it's slightly different than what we saw for the MX security appliance, um, but you can still see you're getting a lot of information. The live tools are a little bit different. Um, it's going to load any current client information momentarily. You can see uptime, uh, things like that. And from the wireless side, you know, we support up to 15 unique SSIDs. Uh, per AP, so you literally can come in here and enable or disable an SSID, name it. Um, once it's up and running and you've allowed it, you would come into the access control page, select the SSID that you just created, and here's where you can come in and modify any association requirements. Uh, you know, do you want to authenticate with, uh, you know, Radius server? Is there going to be a pre-shared key? Is it going to just be an open guest network? Um, so, for example, your guest network, which is uh, disabled at the moment, um, you know, maybe you would have, uh, I guess you want a pre-shared key here, but you could say open if you want. You could say I'm going to have a splash page or I'm not going to have a splash page. And using the splash pages, you actually have a couple of additional authentication options if you prefer. Uh, you can even uh, restrict access to a wireless network until devices enroll in your systems manager network, so in your mobile device management, if you'd like. Uh, and then what you can do is come down. You can do things like even apply group policies by device type. So if you've restricted um, access to particular applications or traffic shapes or throttled or prioritized specific traffic, uh, maybe, you know, things like video conferencing over, over applications like BitTorrent. Uh, you know, you can actually go in and say, all right, if you're an Android, you get this policy. If you are a, uh, a BlackBerry, you get this policy and, and go through this list. So you don't even have to necessarily know what users are, are bringing onto your wireless network. You know that if it's a particular kind of device, it's going to get a particular kind of policy. So that's one thing you can do. But if you wanted to set up a very, very quick and very secure, isolated guest wireless network, literally all you would do is you'd enable that SSID like we did before. You'd select it, um, select your association requirements. All you have to do at that point is then hit NAT mode right here. And what that's going to do is it's going to make sure that the access point um, issues out uh, basically isolated class A IP addresses so everybody's going to get a different class AIP. They can't communicate with each other. They can't communicate with your wired LAN unless you set firewall settings to permit this. But they can get out to the internet. So it's a very quick way to just lock down guest Wi-Fi in about three clicks overall uh, and, and let your guests uh, use that. Uh, and then again, you can see there's a bunch of other wireless options. And we do have uh, webinars devoted to each product line. So if you are uh, itching to get, get way more depth and detail about security appliances or switches or wireless, I would definitely encourage you uh, to check that out. So, dashboard visibility. I guess you can see we, are, uh, we do have a lot of visibility. You can hop and skip between different networks, between different Meraki equipment. You can drill down into individual client devices. Um, one of the things that we haven't shown you yet, but we probably should, is we should actually go in and look at the reporting that's available. So it is possible to come in here and uh, I'll pick, um, maybe we just pick your office Wi-Fi as a good example. Uh, you know, for a given time frame, um, you know, for a given, uh, given network, you can come in and get summary reports, which you can email to yourself or schedule to be emailed. And where this is great is you can literally see, okay, well, which devices are, are being used the most? Um, you know, what does my, my overall client per day total look like? Uh, which SSIDs are getting the most use? And then who are my top clients? Uh, what types of devices are being brought on my network? What operating systems? Uh, so really, really great to sort of be able to drill down really quickly, um, you know, sort dynamically in, in the report, if you'd like. Uh, and you can really get granular with this. If you have a lot of different networks, you can actually tag your network, so apply sort of descriptions to them, you know, East Coast versus West Coast, uh, you know, whatever, you know, corporate versus sales, things like that. Uh, and then if you had tagged your network, all the different tags would show up here. And so you can literally uh, slice and dice your summary report data 
however you see fit. So that's one of the great ways um, that you can go in and, and very quickly see what's happening on your network. Another uh, pretty cool feature is the ability to, um, you know, aside from coming in here, like let's go back to the, uh, the Chicago Odyssey network, aside from being able to come in here and, uh, uh, and see clients, um, you do have the ability to go in and see events logs. You can come in from the organizational side of things and see uh, a, a pretty dynamic change log. So you have the ability to go in and see every change that's been made to your network uh, and by whom. And you can do a search uh, for various criteria like the user or the VLAN that you're talking about or the actual setting. Um, and, uh, and sometimes, I'm not sure why I'm not seeing it on yours, but there's also the ability to, uh, to check traffic analytics. It could be that you just don't have visibility into that feature. Um, and then, of course, you get alerts in administration. So useful, useful visibility there. So in terms of troubleshooting, um, I briefly touched on the live tools. Uh, do you, I guess this looks like an example. Can you give us an example of, of the remote troubleshooting functionality and when you've had to use it? Yeah. We were having an issue with a wired POS terminal. Um, all of our POS terminals are on their own VLAN on the switch. Mm -hmm. And w one of them stopped working. There was no connectivity. It could not uh, talk back to the POS server. And typically, we would have to send a tech out there to figure out what the issue is, if it's an issue with the power on the ship or an issue with the um, cabling or what. But through the dashboard, we were able to run a cable test on the on the terminal and the cabling had recently been um, redone and we were able to determine that the not all the pairs were lined up properly when the wiring was done and that there was a bad pair of wires in the Ethernet cable. So this made it a ton easier to figure out what the issue was and we knew what, exactly what needed to be fixed and then we were able to dispatch someone to fix exactly that problem rather than going there to try to figure out what it might have been. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great, it's one of my favorite live tools for the switch is the cable test. Because really what it'll do, it'll go in, like you said, and test every single pair uh, in, your, in your cable, as well as give you an estimate of cable length. Um, so I've actually had some folks tell me before, you know, we didn't realize our cable was so long, uh, and that was actually um, causing some of the flakiness. So, excellent. But yeah, we've got, we've got the live tools. Again, they're different for every uh, every sort of product line, so the access point live tools are slightly different from the security appliance live tools, for example, um, but they all support things like packet capture, the ability to ping devices, including uh, the Meraki appliance itself, and the ability to check throughput, uh, do things like blink the LEDs, so if you're trying to remotely direct someone to a particular appliance, you can blink the LEDs and they'll all light up. Uh, on the front panels or on the top of the AP, for example, and, and someone can find them. And the ability to do things like reboot uh, equipment. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your uh, future plans? Definitely. We've, we've rolled it out to uh, four ships so far, and we have many more to go. So we will be rolling out the MX, the Switch, and the APs to all remaining ships. Um, what's cool is that we can set them up ahead of time and drop ship the equipment to the locations so that we don't need to physically go out there to, you know, replace the switch or go install an access point. We can go ahead and configure it, and that can be set up physically by someone on site at the ship, and then once that device comes online, it can download the config, and it should be good to go. So we're looking forward to that. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, so thank you. I think um, what I would like to do uh, just before we, we wrap up is I'll just hit um, sort of a top feature for each product line real quick um, just to give folks a little bit of an overview since we seem to have a little bit more time. And then um, we'll wrap up with the slides and, and take any additional questions time permitting. So uh, what I want to do is very quickly look at the, uh, the security appliance now, we, we looked at the status where we went in and, and we saw, uh, you know, okay, here's, here's the security appliance for this particular network. It's offline right now, for example. Um, 
if it were online, we'd be seeing some live traffic data populate here, and you can see which, uh, which ports were actually active. But what I, I think the main uh, feature that, that we've talked about in this presentation, is one of our killer features, is that site-to-site -site VPN. So I just want to show folks how easy it is to set this up. Um, what you do, and this is site-to-site -site IPsec VPN between MX security appliances, is uh, you come in, you, you set up your MX, uh, you enable either a split tunnel or a full tunnel VPN. Uh, your next choice is whether you want a mesh VPN, so everything is talking to everything else, or if you want a hub and spoke model. Um, we use mesh at, at, uh, at the Meraki San Francisco, or Cisco Meraki San Francisco office. Uh, looks like you guys uh, use hub and spoke. If you do select hub and spoke, uh, of course, you'll select your, your VPN concentrator. Um, and literally, the only other choice you need to make is, is which subnets are going to be exportable across the VPN um, from this particular network. And I, I think by default, everything is, is turned on as a yes. So you might actually be done in three clicks uh, from this end. If, if that's the case, and you literally just select the next network go to its security appliance, perform the same three steps, boom, you've got site-to-site -site VPN, and you can very easily check the status of your VPN uh, network and all of your VPN peers from the site-to-site -site VPN page. And once this loads, typically what you'll see is, uh, like we see here, here's all the different VPN peers, here's the subnets that they're exporting. Uh, it's taking a little while to load, so I apologize, but uh, often you'll get uh, heartbeat ping information, so every 10 seconds or so we send out a heartbeat. Uh, and uh, up here, typically what happens is you get uh, some green or orange or red indicators about uh, your VPN status. So I'm just going to refresh real quick and see if that works. Uh, and if not, we will move on. Um, all right, let's just move on real quick. So the switches, one of the features that um, that Eric was talking about was the ability to manage all your ports uh, regardless of switch model, regardless of where in the world the switches are located. And right here for this particular network, we can see we've got one switch. Um, if we were going to, you know, there might be hundreds of switches here depending on your network. Um, but if you want to manage your switch ports, uh, literally what you're going to do is come in to your switch port page, and there's a feature that we call virtual stacking. And we really leverage the cloud to make this possible. It's a very cool feature. Right now, we just had that one switch. So we had 24 switch ports. Uh, but, you know, again, we might have tens of switches or hundreds of switches. It could translate into thousands of switch ports. And it's very, very easy to uh, type in some search criteria. You know, maybe I only want to look at ports 1 through 10. Uh, and again, there's only going to be 10 ports here because we're looking at one switch. Uh, you know, maybe I want to only find, uh, you know, the trunk ports. So there's only one here, um, but maybe if we'll look at the access ports, we could say there are access ports. Uh, and maybe, you know, VLAN 10. Uh, there's, a, there's a slew of different criteria we can search on. There's even some additional commands that are documented in our docs pages. But once you have your list, of switch ports, you can select them all, hit edit, and then go in and make changes. So tag them, name them, enable or disable spanning tree, uh, power over Ethernet, if it's a power over Ethernet enabled switch. You can set port schedules, so the switches are only available to accept traffic at specific times on specific days. Uh, determine whether it's a trunk or an access port. Set port access policies if you want to lock down your wired access so only authenticated users or devices can pass traffic to a port, um, instead of VLANs and voice VLANs and, and things like that. So that's virtual stacking. And then the wireless, um, you know, we did, we did see a bunch of different things. I just want to show you really quickly how you would go in and create a group policy. So we talked about the visibility that you have in the applications and clients. Um, if you were going to set up a group policy, you name it. Um, you can decide uh, with wireless whether or not you want to have that policy be available at certain times on certain days. Uh, you can then go in and say, all right, what I want to do is I want to add a firewall rule. Now maybe I'm going to add a layer 3 firewall rule. Maybe I'm going to add a layer 7 firewall rule because it's very easy given our ability to view applications and, and categories of applications. So maybe I just want to block peer-to-peer -peer traffic 
or just block BitTorrent, for example. Or perhaps I want to traffic shake. So I don't want to block applications outright, but I want to throttle or prioritize them. I can literally come here, I can say, you know, for example, um, I don't know, maybe like Netflix, iTunes, and Hulu are causing me some grief. So there's going to be a per client limit of, we're going to really throttle this down to 250 kilobits per second. So any uh, device or groups of devices or user or groups of users who receive this group policy from a you know, wireless device or from an MX, because you can, you can also do this from the security client side, um, they're going to be blocked from using BitTorrent and their Netflix, iTunes, and Hulu will be throttled immediately to 250 kilobits per second. If I wanted to prioritize these instead, all I have to do is ignore any limits and just move this slider bar up that way. So very, very, very easy to create group policies and then also easy to deploy them. Uh, and then we did take a look at the uh, mobile device management. So um, with that, I think we are at the top of the hour almost. Um, I'm just going to reserve the next minute for questions, uh, and then we'll wrap up. So give me one second. I'm going to mute myself and check with Kat uh, and see if there were any outstanding questions. I'll be right back. So we apparently are getting a bunch of questions on VPN, and can we support the site-to-site -site VPN uh, with third-party non-Meraki devices? Um, and the answer is yes, you, you can actually um, go in and uh, set, set up site-to-site -site VPNs with non-Meraki peers. It's not going to be quite as seamless as if you were setting it up with, uh, obviously, two MSs. But we do support any, any device that supports you know, your standard IPsec. Um, so you can say VPN is something we can work with. And what you can do is you can actually come down and do, 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 do. your dashboard is slightly different than the, than, uh, than the, uh, the, the newer version that I've been used to. But in the site site VPN page, you can go in and add non-Meraki peers here. So this is where you would go in, you type in a pre-shared key, so it's not as automatic. We don't, uh, you know, the cloud uh, and the MX work together behind the scenes to do a lot of the legwork in setting up site to site VPN, which is how we make it so seamless um, when you're using two MXs. So that's a, that's a great question. I'll be right back. Um, and so, Eric, we had a question for you, which is, did you see any improvement once you rolled out Meraki equipment in uh, guest bandwidth or the ability of, of um, I guess, you know, overall bandwidth consumption and usage on the ship? Not really. Um, we're still kind of in the early stages of rolling out the guest Wi-Fi. Um, we're still struggling with figuring out how to provide it to the guests, provide a reliable Wi-Fi to the guests but still stay within our bandwidth limits um, because most of our vessels are on 3G, 4G data mm -hmm. connection. So that's kind of an ongoing issue that we have. Um, but, you know, the Wi-Fi is solid uh, on the network. Okay, great. Um, there was a question, which is, how quickly do group policies get applied to devices? Uh, and the answer is normally it's, it's very quick. Um, you know, if you, if you have healthy access to the cloud, it can be uh, a couple of seconds. Sometimes it, it does take a minute or two. Um, usually the longest I've ever seen uh, dashboard changes uh, taking effect is maybe four to five minutes. Again, assuming that you have appropriate, uh, you know, your, your Internet connectivity is healthy. And so that actually there's another question which we often and always almost always get, which is what happens if you lose connectivity to the cloud? Uh, it's a great question. The answer is your network will continue to operate with its last known configuration settings. So your SSIDs will still broadcast, your firewall rules will still be in play. If you're authenticating to local, you know, Active Directory server, for example, that still works. But of course, you can't go online and open up uh, a browser and tweak your configuration settings. Now, the caveat to that is if you have accidentally blown yourself up uh, through misconfiguration, 
all of our gear support special URLs that you can type in. Um, and I mean, I can just show you here, for example, uh, in the Meraki network for wireless, you know, it's, you come here, uh, and basically there's the ability to go in and configure uh, uplink settings. So perhaps you want to configure, um, you know, VLANs or enable or disable a port or set DATP or IP uh, configuration. I can't click into this because I'm not a full admin on our network and it will prompt me for a username and password, but right away you can see that you can get in if you are directly connected to or directly downstream of Meraki equipment, you can type in these special URLs uh, and get yourself out of hot water. Okay, we're a little bit past the hour, so I do want to be sensitive um, to folks' schedules, but if you asked a question and it didn't get answered, have no fear. We've collected them all and we're going to be sending them out to uh, Meraki reps. So someone should hopefully be contacting you with an answer to your question. Um, but we thank you so much for your time and thank you, Eric, for, for taking the time to chat with us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, and hope everyone has a great day and hope to see you again at a future webinar. Cheers. <laughs>